Good morning, everyone. This is Representative Carolyn Partridge coming to you from my home in Wyndham. And this is the, it's a joint session actually of the House Agriculture and Forestry Committee and the Senate Agriculture Committee. And we are being joined today with, by folks from the Livestock Care Standards Advisory Council. It is February 3rd, 2021. And we welcome you all here. And I'm wondering, Bobby, uh, Senator Starr, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, I, I uh, would just like to welcome uh, the Livestock Care uh, Council to our meeting. And uh, I think all of the senators are, are present. And when we do introductions both, both ways and with the care board, uh, they will all introduce ourselves. So it's a pleasure to be here and to take part in this. Well, Bobby, having said that, why don't you go ahead? And I know your um, committee has a, a whole um, order that they go in to introduce. I'll, I'll then introduce our committee just by calling on folks and letting them introduce themselves. So why don't you go ahead? I'm going to kick it well, off. Well, uh, good morning again, and I'm Bobby. Yeah, go ahead, Bobby. Uh oh, Bobby might be frozen. I'm Bob here, the uh, Senate. Uh, I'm frozen. No, you're, you're frozen. better. Are, you're better. Are we good to go? Yes. Uh, yeah. Well. Good morning, and I'm Bobby Starr, uh, Senator Bobby Starr, Chair of the Senate Ag Committee. And I'm Chris Correct. Pearson, Senator Chris Pearson, Senator from Chittenden County. Anthony Polina, Senator from Washington County. Brian Collimore, representing Rutland County. And Corey Parent, I am the Senator for Franklin County in Alberg. Great, thank you guys. Um, and I'm Representative Carolyn Partridge. I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of Northwest Minster, all of Rockingham and my hometown of Wyndham. And I will call on Rodney to go ahead. Rodney Graham, I represent Orange One District, which is Williamstown, Washington, Orange, Grant, Mercer, and Chelsea. All right, and Tom, you wanna go ahead? I'm Tom Bach. I represent the towns of Chester, Andover, Baltimore, and part of North Springfield. Thanks, Tom. Terry? Terry Norris. I represent the Addison Rutland District, towns of Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whiting. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Vicki? Good morning. I'm Representative Vicki Strong from Albany, and I represent seven towns in Orleans, Caledonia One. Thanks, Vicki. John O'Brien. I'm John O'Brien. I represent one town in Windsor County, that's Royalton, and one town in Orange County, that's Tunbridge. Thanks, John. Henry, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'm Representative Henry Pearl. I represent uh, the Caledonia Washington District, which is Danville, Peachum, and Cabot. Thanks, and Heather? Hi all, Heather Supernat. I represent Windsor 4-1, which is Barnard, Pomfret, Queechy, and West Hartford. All right, thanks, Heather. And uh, I'm gonna ask my committee members if you have questions to use your uh, little blue or yellow hands. And um, Senate members, I will, I think we've got a screen that's um, small enough here. Everybody's on it at this point that I can see you if you wave your hands. I don't know, do you guys use the blue and yellow hands? We can. Okay. You can. <laughs> That's helpful if you can, but uh, our, our real hand. We don't have to use a blue hand. <laughs> All righty. Well, thanks for that. Um, so why don't we kick this off? Uh, the Livestock Care Standards Advisory Council was was an uh, was something that we created several years ago. Kristen will help rem remind me how long ago it was. It was a while. And um, we really appreciate the work that they've been doing all these years as we've asked them to look in uh, to various issues at greater depth than we potentially can. So Kristen, I'm gonna call on you. 
Uh, you're first on the agenda and you can maybe give us a little background. And uh, I have a list here of folks that we would go through. If you want me to call on them, I'm happy to do that. Or if you wanna do it, uh, you can do that. This is your time. And we have about an hour. So I wanna make sure that we can get through everybody so that they have the opportunity to testify before potentially we ask questions. We can always do follow-up questions. So Kristen, why don't you go ahead? Thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you for having us on behalf of the whole council. I know that we have um, many members who are present in this discussion and we have some who had uh, either known in advance or last minute schedule conflicts and aren't able to join us. Um, but uh, we do appreciate uh, the House and Senate Ag Committee members taking the time in your guys' schedule to, to talk with us. I think that this meeting each year is um, important because we have turnover on, on both sides and we do have some new members on the Livestock Council um, that, that uh, hopefully you can get to know a little bit better today and then a reacquaintance with, with, the, with the more experienced members who are, are on the council. Uh, Representative Partridge, you're correct. The the council, um, it's in its beginnings uh, was back in I think 2011, 2012, somewhere in that neighborhood, and yes, um, it's been in its current format for now um, almost all except for that very first year, and um, it's a 14 member council that is uh, chaired by uh, currently by Diane Bothfeld, who's on. So I, in a moment, I'm going to default to Diane as our council chair to uh, manage things from here. But, um, and, and what, what I think is especially nice about this council and what I hope the, the legislative committee members appreciate or will come to appreciate is the fact that it brings together a diverse group of uh, you know, subject matter experts and boots on the ground, real people in Vermont who are, who are operating and running businesses in these different sectors that have a say in or have a vested interest in uh, animal well-being, livestock and, and poultry well-being. So what I hope is a, nice for, for you as committee members is that um, you can kind of, by incorporating the Livestock Council into your processes and, and seeking advice from us as an entire group, you can then get the input uh, of representatives from these different sectors. So it can be sort of considered one-stop shopping for you. Um, granted, it, it's not fully comprehensive, but it, it gets you a, a pretty good diverse perspective from a number of different individuals um, when you get an opinion from, from the Livestock Council. I did um, share with Linda, a couple of days ago, some past examples of position statements that the council has um, put together uh, at your request, at the request of the of the committee chairs over the years. And while we're not proposing to go over those um, in, in any detail really at all, we wanted you to have them in one place as just an example of what the council can, um, can do for you and the service that we can uh, provide. So I certainly have enjoyed serving on this group. I, I find it to be very encouraging and, um, and rewarding process, the discussions that we have. Uh, and so I, so by way of introduction of myself, um, Kristen Haas, I'm the state veterinarian and director for the food safety and consumer protection division for the agency. And um, I have been on the council since its beginning and I think serve as the quasi administrative support person for it, uh, keeping the minutes and, and that sort of thing. And on that note, we did submit uh, our annual report for your consideration, which comprises the minutes of our meetings from 2020. So you have that on file as well if you're interested in looking at that. And so Diane, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for the mechanics of introductions and that sort of thing. Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, Diane Bothfeld, I'm a Director of Administrative Services for the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Uh, I am Secretary Tebbett's designee to chair the Livestock Council and have been uh, for this current secretary as well as previous secretaries um, uh, to be the, the chair of this committee. Um, so I'm very pleased to do that. It's a great group, uh, lots of uh, diverse knowledge and information that comes forward. So I'll manage the introductions uh, and I'm just going to go uh, using what I can see as a, a Zoom lineup. And uh, one of our newer members, Christina, um, Ashley, if you'd like to introduce yourself. 
and your and your uh, uh, current uh, work environment and and why you're glad to be on the council. Uh, Christina Ashley, I'm a law enforcement officer with Essex Police Department. I uh, have been here for 35 years and I am a new member um, representing a law enforcement component on this uh, council and I'm quite honored to have been asked to join. I'm quite anxious to get to know you all and see what I can do to help. Thank you, Christina. Tara? Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Tara Eschker and I work at NEK Processing where I'm kind of part of the slaughterhouse industry um, aspect of it. Um, I just joined this year, so I have a lot to learn, but from what I see on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, um, and working with farmers, you know, I feel like I can bring a good um, aspect to it. Thank you, Tara. Ben Notterman. Hi, good morning. Ben Notterman here at Snug Valley Farm in Hardwick. Uh, we're a grass-fed beef and uh, pastured pork producer. Um, so I have uh, backgrounds in both uh, regenerative ag grazing as well as, uh, as the pork aspect. Thank you, Ben. Um, Rhonda, Molly Brook Farm. <laughs> May have frozen up a bit. Um, yeah, it looks like she's frozen. Yeah. If Maybe you want we want to go. Molly, if you can, uh, no, who is it? Rhonda. Molly Rhonda. Rhonda, if you, if you could turn off your video, we might be able to hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yep. Hi, I'm Rhonda Miller Goodrich. Um, I'm with Molly Brook Farm. We're a small dairy in Cabot, Vermont. Thank you, Rhonda. And next would be Steve. And yeah, get yourself uh, off mute. Off mute, muted. Good morning. I'm Steve Kahart, uh, commercial dairy operation. Uh, we're an LFO with my brother Tim in Addison, Vermont. I've been on the council for two years. Thank you, Steve. And Joanne? Hi, my name is Joanne Nichols. I work with the Humane Society of Chittenden County. I'm the humane investigator there. Um, I've been doing uh, humane investigations, uh, animal cruelty and neglect work for, uh, for the Humane Society probably since 2007 and maybe a little earlier. Um, I've been on the council. This is my second three-year term. So I think it's been probably four years now that I've been on the council. And um, I, yeah, I, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne and Kent. Morning, Kent Henderson. Um, I'm a retired, a longtime dairy exclusive veterinarian from Northwestern Vermont. Um, and I, my role on the board is my close connection with uh, dairy farmers and uh, long association with issues and looking at the tremendous transition that's gone on in Vermont and in the uh, dairy industry and uh, the issues that you folks are facing and what we can bring to it. Thank you. And Representative Partridge, that uh, is, I believe, all of the Livestock Care Advisory Council members. Yes, it is. Diane. Thank you, oh, Thank you Diane. Kristen, oh. whoop, did I miss one? No, 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 you didn't. I, but I, I'm aware of some folks who weren't able to be on. So perhaps for the benefit of the of the legislators, we can I can touch on who those are if that would suit. Please that do. sounds good. Okay, great. Um, so Ruth Blyweichel, uh, many of you know she is a she is uh, has been on the council as long as Dr. Henderson has been, and um, she is actually helping with the COVID vaccine. Uh, locations this morning, so she was unable to join. Um, Ruth has represented uh, University of Vermont on the council. Uh, Eliza Rutherford might join us later. Um, she is the owner and manager of, um, of um, oh my goodness, Hanoverians. Uh, 
<laughs> blanking on her business name. Um, anyway, she is a horse breeder, manager, owner, um, runs a business in, in Charlotte, Foxwood Hanoverians. Apologize, right, that, that's right. the name, right. name of her business. Uh, and she has a colt uh, shipping to um, another state and because of weather delays that got postponed to today. So she might join us um, when that is finished up, but she is with her shipper at the moment. And then uh, lastly, we have Tracy Webb. Tracy is a relatively new member of the council, new this year. Um, Tracy is with NFO Livestock up in Franklin County, and so um, has joined the council as a representative of, of that, that sector. So um, Diane, I apologize for interrupting, but those are the council members who are not able to be with us and Eliza might, might join um, midway through. Thanks. Oh, that is fine. Okay. Um, so the next agenda item, uh, Representative Partridge, I think we're ready to, to jump into that. Uh, go right ahead, Diane. I, okay. I, I want to just uh, highlight the fact that when we put this, this uh, council together, our goal was to have folks from a lot of different uh, areas in the whole livestock um, arena. And I think you can, we can see from the folks you've introduced that that has been accomplished. So, um, and, and I also wanna say a big thank you to these folks because they're working as volunteers, essentially. I'm not even, we give them lunch. I'm not even sure about that. So, so <laughs> no, Diane said no. <laughs> so anyway, um, Diane, why don't you go ahead? Thanks okay. so much. Um, thank you very much. So we've worked on a variety of projects over the years. And if, you, if we've got something from you as a legislative mandate that you want us to work on, we certainly dive into that. But there's lots of different um, issues out there impacting uh, livestock and, and well-being in the state. And so we have embarked on a couple of different things. But right now we're working on a uh, document brochure type for those who do um, uh, inspections or not not so much inspections they're called out to uh, look at animal well-being concerns and it's very difficult to to um, you know look at a situation and and determine what what the issues are and one of the things that we've been looking at closely is the the body condition of the animals so we we get a lot of calls at the agency the first time it snows and horses are outside um, you know, oh, they've got snow on them. That, that's terrible. And it, it depends. There's always a, it depends with with livestock. And so the body condition score of an animal are they are they uh, are they plump? Are they skinny? Are they you know do they have feed access? Do they have some form of shelter or not? So all of those questions. But we really are focusing in at this time on that body condition score and putting together a document to um, assist those who are called out to look at these situations around, is an animal too skinny, too fat, you know, those kind of questions. So that's an intro to, to you, Kristen, for, for greater detail on that. Uh, but we've been working with livestock. Uh, Joanne Nichols as well has been working with Kristen on this. So I'll leave it to you, the, the two of you to add some better detail to that than my overview. Sure. Th thanks, Diane. I think um, so. I actually stayed up past my bedtime last night and listened to the recording of the testimony that the House Agriculture Committee took yesterday on livestock shelter. Um, that's the perennial discussion I know that comes up every every year. So uh, and I believe it was Representative O'Brien who referenced the fact that you have received in the past testimony from this council and from others about you know, wow, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to uh, to use an assessment of direct measures for for animal welfare versus versus the environmental pieces? And um, and that is a that is a legislatively, I, I understand that that is um, there are many reasons that why that is difficult at best and perhaps not even possible. So as a way to, to kind of fill in that gap, the, the council um, determined that perhaps it would be helpful to develop a resource for humane officers to utilize, at least making them aware of the importance of body condition scoring when they're evaluating livestock and poultry for animal welfare uh, concerns. And so um, kudos to, to Ruth Blyweichel and Joanne Nichols, who have really spearheaded this, this effort. And um, if I can successfully share my screen, 
and I didn't let Linda know this in advance, so perhaps I cannot. It says um, host has disabled screen participant sharing. So perhaps that's not going to be possible, but. Hey, well, Kristen, hold on. Maybe we can make that happen. Um, Linda or Mike, is that something we can do? Yes, Mike. should be able to make you a co-host, Kristen. Yes. <clears throat> Mike? All right, I think they're working on making you a co-host, Kristen. Okay, I, I apologize. I should have um, <laughs> I should have reached out to Linda about this before I, I've neglected to do that. Um, so this, this brochure, so what we're envisioning for it is that it will be a quick reference guide to one, here is what body condition scoring is about. Here's why it can be important. Um, here are some resources for you as a humane officer uh, to be able to go and get more information on species specific body condition scoring. And to the extent that this helps you as a humane officer, when you're evaluating these cases, here's, here's perhaps a way to bring uh, focus to the importance of body condition scoring without putting it in an actual law and, and trying to define in every circumstance across the entire state of Vermont what, what is acceptable and what is not. So that's what we intend um, to use the, or to disseminate the brochure as. Um, and we've talked about uh, sharing that not only with humane officers, but also um, Diane and I were talking just last week um, about also disseminating it to towns, town offices within Vermont, because there's so much variability from town to town as to who has that responsibility. So getting it in their hands, um, as well as it can be a resource for livestock and poultry owners too, you know, to let, let them know what might be assessed when uh, when a humane officer visits their property to to follow up on an, on an allegation. So um, we hope that it'll be a nice complement to the, the law Act 116 that you all enacted uh, last year. And even if that wording in that law was to change, it, it can still, this brochure can still potentially serve as a, um, as a, as a standalone uh, document. Maybe Joanne, if, if you would, like to add more on that. So Joanne, as one of the people who um, is tasked with investigating um, these cases, uh, we, you know, Joanne has been involved with putting this together um, and looking at it through the lens of a person who might be using it on the other side of the equation. So Joanne, I'll open it to you if you have other comments you'd like to make about it. Uh, hi. So. Um, so I find that the, that this is a is a good um, as Kristen says a, a good um, it's a a good complement to to uh, to offer to um, people like myself who are in the field who may not be as experienced as you know somebody who owns livestock. So um, yeah, I guess I don't have that much to add to what Kristen said. Um, other than um, that, that it's really important and it is kind of a complex um, situation to walk into uh, when you're a humane investigator or an animal control officer or the health officer for the town um, to walk in on an evaluating livestock when maybe more of your experiences with dogs and cats. So this is a really good uh, way for people in my field to get more education and find out where more resources are. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, J uh, Kristen, I think you are now co-host, so you can share okay. your screen if you'd like. Great, so let me, there we go. All right, it's showing up on my end. Is it showing up for you folks? Yep, yes. Diane, thumbs up. Yep. I know that's 
signal well. <laughs> um, so this is just a, uh, you know, one mock-up. Um, we are fortunate to have Terry Smith in the Agency of Agriculture, Anson and Alan, Secretary and Deputy Secretary's Executive Assistant, who, who also has some skills in layout uh, and formatting. So she's been helping us with this. And what you're, what you're seeing here is a one mock-up version. Um, if we were to turn this into a bifold brochure, um, we also have a mock-up for a trifold brochure. And really, probably what it will boil down to is is the preference of the livestock council, as well as how small the font has to be in each scenario, and making sure that it things remain legible for for folks. But um, what you're seeing here is the the basically the the first the cover page um, that just you know highlights the the topic, and then on the back side of this bifold layout would be other links. Uh, that are uh, species specific links for more information on body condition scoring, short videos and tutorials that would walk a humane officer through the basics of how they might use this mm -hmm. skill set to evaluate, evaluate animals. And then um, the center. There we go. The center of the brochure would would have the you know substantive information, um, acknowledging that it, it, there's there's way more information on this topic that people would need to know, ideally as compared to what can fit in a bifold or a trifold brochure. But um, we figured since many people are not familiar with the anatomy of poultry, and and they're actually pretty easy to body condition score, that having a diagram of poultry. Of a, of a chicken or rooster, whichever, um, and then having a you know single large animal species, and we use a, a beef cow as the representative there, and, and giving people an idea of the basic anatomy and what they what areas of the body they would either need to be visualizing or palpating or feeling in order to to make an assessment, and then the verbiage that is here accompanies you know those basic principles. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the, the general idea of, of where we are um, going. Uh, again, uh, even some of the Livestock Council members, since I just sent this mock up to them uh, last night, uh, may not have, this may be the first time they're seeing the actual mock up. So there's still some, some work to be done on this, but I would expect that within the next couple of months at the latest, we could get this finalized, get it to a printer and um, and get it get it out to people. The other thing that is interesting to me or worth mentioning perhaps is we do have, some of you may recall a uh, number of years ago, we, we did an outreach initiative where we, um, where we uh, developed best practices for cattle and calf transport. And uh, there was a little bit of fundraising money left over from that effort. So that's what we intend and we've held on to it. And that's what we intend to uh, use to cover the cost of the printing for this brochure, thinking that it is all in the same vein and, and the people who donated mm -hmm. that money would be um, amenable to putting it for, to use in, in this instance, since it also supports uh, animal welfare and well-being and improves hopefully the investigatory process. So, and Kristen, this will still be this will be online as well, right? Yeah, thank you. Good, good point. Yes, we will print. We will print some, but then yes, this will be an electronic format um, that will remain and and live, and that will be nice because you know presumably if the links change or some other information changes, it can be updated as we go. So yes, it will it will be it will exist in electronic format as well and be accessible to folks. Fantastic. So, Ian, do you want to continue, or Kristen, do you want to continue? Um, yeah, I think that wraps up our, our discussion on the brochure. The, the mm -hmm. bill that you folks took testimony on um, this past week, H116, or maybe I've, hopefully I've got that bill number correct, Act 116, pardon me, um, was brought up in this discussion of the brochure. But if there's any other questions about the brochure that we're working on prior to, to moving on? Well, Diane, one of the questions that was asked yesterday was uh, regarding complaints and, and farmers felt that they really wanted to know who was making the complaint. Um, and I don't know whether Kristen or you could answer that question. Uh, doesn't have to be a long explanation, but I know in the past it's been a source of uh, frustration because in the past it seems that 
uh, no one particularly wanted to handle it. Um, and so I don't know if we can talk a little bit about that before moving on, but if you could, that would be great. Okay. Um, I'll hand that one off to Kristen since she manages a lot of those potential complaints at the agency. Sure. So with regard to the anonymity um, discussion, my understanding from talking with our, uh, uh, with Thea Schwartz, our assistant attorney general assigned to the agency, because we've posed this question to her, is that um, yes, someone can make an anonymous complaint. Uh, we can, at the program level at the agency, maintain that as an anonymous complaint. However, um, she cautioned that if the complaint were to go further or end up in court, it, it, it's not possible for us to, to for, um, indefinitely keep that anonymous. Like if we write it down somewhere, that is a public record and we, we do keep records and we have to you know, document things. And so oftentimes uh, if a case were to proceed far enough, then that anonymity would be, <clears throat> would be lost is what has been uh, told to me by, by our, legal, our legal counsel. Um, perhaps the humane officers could speak from a law enforcement perspective as to how that works in, in their shop. And then the other thing that I would say is that, as you know, the Agency of Agriculture um, is not the entity to actually investigate or enforce in these, in these cases. So uh, we provide technical assistance and play a support role to the humane officers should they ask for that assistance, but it is at their lead and they, as the, the folks vested with that authority are you know, calling the shots with regard to, to steps in the process and final outcome and that sort of thing. The humane officers in, in conjunction with the state's attorneys and, and others in that, in that realm. And so if uh, Joanne or Christina wanted to speak to the, the question of anonymity, that would be great as well. Um, <clears throat> go ahead, Christina. Uh, thank you. In terms of law enforcement, if we get a complaint issued to us, no, oh, my wife's going out, but um, that is documented and that is available to be discovered or to be shared, you know, we understand that uh, sometimes we don't want to give that information out immediately, but that is something that really can't be hidden and, and kept away. The person who's involved in, in an investigation has a right to uh, ask for a records request, which would give all that information, the complainant's information. So we can keep it quiet initially, but at some point it would be able to be shared. Thank Joanne. you, Christina. Yep, and <clears throat> Joanne. Um, I, I don't really have that much to add other than what um, Christina has had added about the law enforcement piece and um, if somebody requests records. Um, you know, as my role as a humane investigator, if I'm on scene, if I'm on <laughs> somewhere and somebody asks that question, I, I don't give out that, that information at that time. Um, but yeah, as, as a case would move forward, um, that could come out later. Bobby? Yeah, I, I just think that, um, you know, this process is a very timely process. Um, what we keep hearing in, in the Senate, uh, at least committee, is there's a lot more people uh, in Vermont keeping uh, animals uh, for food uh, security reasons. And, and I think this is a great idea about having this for sure and and uh, the other important part is it'll help humane officers um, from one end of the state to be all sort of using the same criteria to judge whether the animals are are um, you know mistreated or misused and 
So both of those things are, I think, a very positive uh, part of what you folks have all been working on in a, in a great idea. And you know, Bobby, I just want to add that uh, last year we had a bill that uh, defined humane officer, which didn't make it over to you because of the pandemic. And uh, that is something that everybody worked on. Every, all these different groups came together and were, were satisfied with the definition. And so I think that might be something we'll send to you, and we'll try to send to you again, um, and that will help clarify uh, who should be doing what. Somebody told me that you took that bill back home with you and forgot to bring it back. <laughs> I think it's still stuck to our wall or something up in Montpelier. I actually think it might have been on the calendar. So <laughs> we can check. But I don't need any extra debris around this place. <laughs> All right, Diane, why don't you continue? All right. So uh, the legislative uh, Act 116 uh, was brought up. Are there any anything that from the testimony you heard um, uh, this past week in House Agriculture, are there are there activities or items you'd like the Livestock Council to to look into um, in in relationship to that um, concerns that have been brought forth? I mean, it it is an act. It was enacted last session, and it, it seems that folks have some concerns about it. Uh, testifying to you this week uh, in House Ag, is there anything that you would like the Livestock Council to to look into surrounding that? act or the concerns regarding um, the uh, act? Well, I think one of the messages uh, we took away from yesterday and others can chime in here, but uh, one of the messages was that frequently uh, folks, especially folks who are new to Vermont, don't necessarily um, understand that animals can live outside and particularly folks who do grazing and Ben might be able to want to chime in on this, but um, that, you know, some of the re the requirements of that bill create a situation that are that is potentially um, uh, difficult for people in particular who are grazing their animals. You know, in terms of being exposed to sun. You know, the the purpose of the bill, as John O'Brien so eloquently said yesterday, was really to help folks who are doing this and make it clear that natural shelter was. Uh, a possibility and that they didn't necessarily have to have constructed shelter. So uh, if we decide to go and take a look at that, perhaps the Livestock Council can can help us with that way in. I, I know that you, you all, Kristen did last session, uh, the last biennium to, to try and make it as clear as possible. But uh, if we do decide to look at it, then we might need some help. And, you know, I see Rodney's hand is up. Rodney? Just to, just to quickly add to that, um, one of their other concerns was if they, if they used the woods for a uh, shelter that it screwed up their current use program, if they had forests and rolls and stuff like that. So I don't know if that's anything you want to add into that. Yeah, and I think we'll probably be hearing from Jill Remick again in the near future, and we can ask her uh, about that. And for those who don't know, Jill Remick um, is the head of PV, uh, property valuation and review at the Department of Taxes. Uh, John O'Brien's hand is up, and then I see Anthony's hand is up. So uh, John, you go, and then we'll have Anthony. Thank you. I, I thought while we had this gang on, and, and looking back on yesterday too, uh, someone like Joanne might know that it seems like the, the sort of animal cruelty and, and animal welfare issues for livestock must run to, you know, on one side, you've got the sort of red flag situations where it's either a hoarder of animals, you know, they got 47 horses and they've just, they don't have enough feed or, or, you know, small backyard type things where, for whatever reason, you know, it's like, I got to feed the kids or the animals and they've just run out of money um, and the animals are mistreated. So you have those cases. And then on the other side, what Carolyn was just referencing, you know, you have, have people who don't understand livestock 
and and are, are sort of fall into the harassment side of things. Um, so I just wondered if you aggregated the complaints, um, both of who's who's complaining and also what in general, what kind of animals are the complaints targeted at? You know, is it mostly horses? Is it, you know, dairy cows? Because you might see the ribs on a jersey and it's fine. Uh, and, and I thought if you had that kind of aggregation, then that, that might inform, say, even the pictures you put on your brochure, if, if there's sort of data for that. So I don't know if you want to speak to that. I don't know who wants to take that. I, if, if that. Is that a question for you, Kristen, or? I think, um, well, I, again, if Joanne and or Christina are willing, um, I, I will say the complaints that come into the agency, and, and again, we then refer those, so, um, so we don't keep a database on them, but uh, Anecdotally, Representative O'Brien, I would say that those complaints this time of the year um, mostly have to do with dairy cows and horses. Um, people seem, generally speaking, very, very concerned um, when they see a horse in a snowy pasture without a blanket or you know, in a paddock that doesn't have a run-in shed or trees. And, and as you heard yesterday, um, if horses as well as other livestock species are well conditioned to the climate and the environment and are in good body condition and have adequate feed and roughage, et cetera, they, they do quite well. So, um, but we get a lot of, of drive-by cell phone, drive-by calls. Um, I drove by and I saw a horse in a field. I didn't see any water and it didn't have a coat on. So, you know, this is a problem. So I, I think anecdotally this time of the year, those are the, the majority of the calls that we receive. Yeah. But Joanne if, if, or Christina, they may have more <laughs> accurate, detailed information. I, I agree with you, Kristen. Um, that is pretty much what we, we get historically, um, especially this time of year. And um, yeah, and I just try to educate. I always speak to whomever is the owner of the animals and then get back to the complainant to hopefully educate them so when they continue to drive by, they don't continue to call. Joanne, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say my experience um, with concerns uh, for livestock are usually, are usually cattle out in the field and, uh, and horses. And, and um, some, sometimes there's concerns for, for sheep as well. Um, but, uh, but generally they do come, in, a lot of complaints will come in when the, when the weather gets extreme, whether it's really hot or really cold, or if there's a snowstorm coming in, um, people will, will start calling with their concerns. So, so that, that, that's a very normal pattern. So, you know, the, the counties that I cover is Chittenden and Grand Isle counties. Um, so in my experience, you know, you, I would, I would kind of have an idea of what, you know, when calls are gonna start coming in, what the concerns are probably gonna be about if I know a snowstorm is coming or it's been snowing for a day and there's a, horse out there with snow on its back. Um, so you can usually sometimes predict these kinds of things, but then again, you do have, you know, you do have the really serious concerns out there as well when animals are not thriving. Um, um, but one, one note that I, that I do wanna say is, is that over the last couple of years, um, this is just a little bit of a history about uh, being a humane investigator. Um, it used to be that complaints came into humane societies in Vermont. Um, and over the last couple of years, I would say two or three years, humane societies have pushed all those uh, concerns now into law enforcement agencies. So, um, so my role now uh, as a humane investigator is supporting law enforcement um, with cases. So, so play, complaints over the last few years have not come directly to me because they're all getting um, moved to law enforcement agencies. 
And, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. And I, I won't take your time of why that's moving in that direction now, but just, just to give you a little bit of a history about my position. Thanks, Joanne. Um, I want to call on Anthony, make sure he gets his question or comment in. And then Thanks Terry has his hand up. Go Thanks. ahead. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I presume that you folks have heard from grazers and others who are concerned about the, what I would say, the requirement that animals are, are protected from direct exposure to the elements. And that, that's difficult for people who do a lot of grazing and rotational grazing and instead would, you know, the elements are the sun and the wind and the rain and whatnot, which are elements, but they're not necessarily harmful in, in, on an everyday basis. And maybe we should be looking at protecting these animals more free, more when it comes to like bad weather, inclement weather. I'm just wondering if you've heard that, that it would be, it's a sort of a difficult requirement to keep your animals protected from the elements, whatever they are, because they're so broad, as opposed to just bad weather, which would make it more doable for, grazers, rotational grazers, uh, grass farmers, those kinds of folks. I'm just curious whether you've heard that as well as I have. Anthony, who are you asking that of? I guess anybody. We did hear that yesterday. And uh, what I think the intent of the, the language from last year was to make sure that animals at least could get out of the sun if it was a blisteringly hot day, for instance. It wasn't that they couldn't be out grazing. Um, so we you know, will potentially take a look at that and see if there are some improvements. As I said earlier, we'd be potentially calling on Livestock Care Standards Advisory Council for help with that. Right, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. Um, Terry? Yeah, I think this, uh, if we could kind of, uh finalize these things uh, as far as uh, what the the care of the animals is and who's who's really in charge of enforcing I think that would be a great thing I mean I noticed yesterday I probably shouldn't say this but I felt a real animosity from some of the the farmers that testified and the animosity was directed against dairy animals dairy cows and they thought that they were getting this free ride. So, I mean, if, if the farmers can't agree on what's adequate care for animals, I don't think we can expect the general public to, to be able to drive by a farm or, you know, a field with animals in and really know what to do. So I think, uh, you know, as far as eliminating that part, it's, you know, the complaints are still going to be there. But, so hopefully, at least we can to give some guidelines to what uh, people can do. Thanks, Terry. And Kristen or Diane, you might want to um, hop in here. I, you know, my understanding is that there are certain requirements of uh, dairy farmers in terms of the care for their cows uh, which is one of the reasons that they were exempt from Act 116. And I, so any comment from either of you, Kristen, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I thank you for bringing that up. I would hate for anyone to think that, the, or have this perception that dairy, the dairy industry and dairy cows are just off the hook with all of this. That is, that is absolutely not, not the case. There couldn't be anything further, further from the truth. Um, and, and actually maybe uh, Dr. Henderson, I know you've been very involved in the, the FARM program and have a lot of information on that. And perhaps Kent could, could say a few words about that. And then, um, Rhonda, from your perspective, you know, perhaps sharing what what you do with with your dairy animals and how you the the things that you are subjected to with regard to their well being um, and expected to uphold. Maybe that would be inf informative for the committee as well. But but Ken, do you want to? Does that work, Representative Partridge? Yeah, yep, yeah, it totally does. And Ben, are you raising your hand or no? I just uh, want to, okay, fine. I mean, I can chime in if needed, but I think uh, the, the other folks are probably more suited for the dairy. Okay, thanks. All right, why don't we go ahead with Kristen's plan? All right, well then I'll just jump in here and I'll just say that I've got a, 
got a 45 year history of working with dairy farmers and um, really going back at least 35 years ago, uh, the industry itself started recognizing and addressing and um, has really moved ahead. Uh, they recognize that good animal husbandry practices goes hand in hand with good economic results in the farm. So it's just common sense. There's been a real push on a national basis from the actual uh, milk marketing uh, uh, world uh, that are purchasing the milk from the farmers and they are laying out standards that farmers have been following. Uh, a simple example is tail docking. And whereas 30 years ago, it was being advertised as something to make the milk more clean and make the barn more clean. And it's turned into an issue that it really couldn't be defended on a, uh, a humane basis on treating the animals. And it was not a popular uh, uh, fight or, uh, statute, but the milk marketing uh, uh, portion of the industry just insisted this cannot go on. And they put that into, uh, they, they put that, they put teeth into that and uh, they won't pick up milk from farms that dock tails. Um, and that, that's just an example. Of, of how things have moved ahead in the industry. There, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of eyes on this. There's a lot of resources. The dairy veterinarians have been working with the farmers. Uh, we started really working on animal housing. That was one of the big things that I started working on 30 years ago. Um, as these freestyle barns were going up, we knew it was great that the animals could, could get up and move whenever they wanted to. They could go get feed and water whenever they wanted to, but were they in a proper size stall? And that's something that has been worked on and um, farmers realize and they're getting uh, better production out of their animals, making them more comfortable. And it's something that they've really taken off with. Um, I think that, you know, the industry is very deeply into this. And I, so I'm thinking that the uh, bill that you're looking at, the 116, is meant for maybe a different, a different cause than something that's as far down the road as the dairy industry is on its own as far as addressing these issues. Thanks, Kent. And Rhonda, do you want to comment? Um, yes, I, I would. I mean, I'd like to add that um, Kristen is right. I mean, we're regulated. The farm program comes, uh, a representative comes and takes a look at how we care for our animals every three years. Um, we are an organic herd. So NOFA inspects our herd and the standards are really high. Our milk producer, Stonyfield, they have really high standards and they're on our farm, I don't know, four or five times a year. Um, and not only that, we work with our animals seven days a week. And a lot of farmers work with their animals every day. And you can't put that much time into a group of animals and not really care about them and care about their welfare. Um, it's, you know, economically, it's, it's to a farmer's advantage to take good care of their cows, make sure that they're warm and dry and well-fed and watered and they get the proper amount of exercise. Um, I, I guess I can't honestly think of a farmer that doesn't do all of those things. I mean, and, and you know, we're really connected in the farm industry. Um, our farm has been um, going in the same family since 1835. So, you know, we have a long history in this state. I guess that's all I have to add. Representative Partridge. Yes, thanks Rhonda. Go ahead, Diane. So the FARM program, there are teeth to that program. Uh, the agency interacted with a farm that lost their market last year because the animals were too thin. Uh, they were given an opportunity to remedy that situation multiple times. They didn't remedy the situation and the farmer, the dairy farmer lost their market. They had no longer sell milk. They're out of the dairy business. Once they were in that situation, the other dairy co-ops would not take their milk because of the animals were too thin. So it has teeth, it is active in Vermont, and it has consequences, the FARM program in Vermont. And Diane, could you say what FARM stands for in this case? Farmers. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to need help, Kristen. Farmers uh, A. Assuring, farmers assuring responsible management. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. 
Uh, anything else anyone wants to add on this? Uh, is there is there something any of you would like to um, say? I, I noticed that we have about just over five, maybe six minutes left and um, want to know if there's anything, any other questions from the either committee or if there's anything that anyone here wants to add at this point. Bobby. Yes, um, I don't know who raised the question about animals uh, being out and going into the woods and possibly losing their current use. I, I can't imagine um, where that issue came from because, you know, it certainly isn't in the current use law. So I don't know where where that could possibly be coming from, but I'm glad you're going to check it out. Um, and um, you know, I I think this has been a good meeting, and I I know Diane and and uh, Kristen, you know, they know that they can contact us anytime, but it's. It's very important for any members of the board if they so choose or, or want to come um, and talk to us about an issue that we could help fix to make their jobs run more smoothly. I think this brochure is really, uh, it should be a real positive uh, step forward. And I know up north, we have a, if we, have problems. It's usually with somebody that runs out of feed. Uh, they moved here, you know, a few years back and we're going to live off the land and they've got, you know, a few animals and, and they forget that we have a long winter and they don't have adequate feed uh, for, for those animals and they run into trouble. And, you know, and in most of these cases, if we could get to these people, other farmers would, I bet, pitch in and take some feed there to, to help them get by, but they don't, I don't know if they're, if they're embarrassed to call or, or what they think, but you, know, you don't usually hear about these animals tucked in a barn that aren't getting properly fed until somebody, uh, you know, a vet goes by or somebody goes in and and finds them in trouble. Yeah, that's a really good point. And you know, this year is going to be tough for some of us who had decreased hay crops. Um, I was fortunate to to find some hay to keep going, but uh, Bobby, we were actually talking. Uh, a week or two ago about you starting up a hay, a hay convoy with some of your old trucks just well, because folks are, are going to need it. I can't <laughs> remember when this shortage came up down down in the south somewheres and um, I know we loaded up a couple of trailer truck loads and donated our you know our equipment to take that hay down, which farmers donated to put in the trucks. It had to have been 15 years ago or, or more. Exactly right. That, I think it was Iowa. I think it was Iowa, Bobby. That's well, what Jack I, was I saying. I can't remember other than, um, you know, it was, it was a good thing to do and a lot of people participated. Yeah. And it was, a, it was something that was definitely the Vermont way of helping out fellow farmers. Um, any final remarks from uh, Diane or Kristen? Um, I see no hands up. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna thank you all for joining us today. This has been really helpful. And I think we might be uh, talking with you again regarding this uh, grazing issue. So um, Bobby, any last words from you? Well, just, uh, you know, Many of us never get many thanks for the good th work that we do. And I'm sure your council is in no different position and uh, just wanna thank you very much for all the time and hard work that you put into this and, and helping to 
protect and make our animals healthier and stronger and 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 make society uh, understand really um, the proper way of taking care of animals. Thanks, Bobby. And for the, now we're going to um, uh, again, thank you all. And we're going to go off.